Buenas tardes, WonderCon! I am so excited to be sitting here today with these amazing creatives who are paving the way for Latinx representation in entertainment. Mi gente, how are we feeling today? Great. 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 Yes. Good. I'd love to start off today's panel by sharing some research from the UCLA Hollywood Diversity Report 2022. In their report, they found out that only three out of 10 film directors are people of color, only 2.2 out of 10 film directors are women, and only 3.2 out of the 10 film writers are people of color. They also found out that Latinx creatives make up 7.1% of film leads, 7.7 of all film roles, and 7.1% of all film directors, and even more staggeringly, 5.6% of writers. Those are some sad, humbling numbers, which is why it's so important for us today to have conversations like the one we're about to have, and we can learn to support our Latinx creatives and other minority groups as well. So these amazing champions are paving the way for change, and uh, they're pushing the narrative and transforming the landscape for the Latinx community. I'm so thrilled to be here at WonderCon with these amazing people that I get to call my colleagues, my friends, and mi gente. Please give them a round of applause. For them. <laughs> You know, I want to begin and I want to recognize that, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and different parts of this industry and finding ourselves here, we all have our own individual journeys and I want to hear a little bit from each of you on how you got to this stage today. George, let's start with you. Thank you, thank you. Buenas tardes todos. Uh, thank you for having me. And I just want to say something real quick though is, you know, I am very joyful, joyful to see this panel of Latinos here sitting here because I've been in this industry for a long time. And this is kind of one of the first times I've been with an all Latino table panel, <laughs> which is fantastic. So I congratulate everyone here uh, for, for doing what they're doing. Uh, the journey started, wow, I don't know, 20 years ago. The whole point was for I wanted to become the next Gordon Gecko, so I went into the finance world, which it didn't pan out. <laughs> so then the next best thing was entertainment. So I was trying to find my way to see where I kind of fit in. I mean, I'm not an actor, director, writer, so I'm kind of in the low, you know, level of it. So I realized that I had to start from the bottom, so I entered into a talent agency to become an agent. So I was there for about eight, nine years, um, learned the business from the ground up, and saw the holes of the industry, basically one being the, the representation of Latinos. There weren't, I mean, I'm talking here early 2000s, so there was none of that yet, and the whole point to that, I was, you know, wanted to become a producer. So the next step was, after eight years, nine years of the agency, uh, this great TV show came out, which was called Ugly Betty, which was a TV format, <laughs> which it just sparked my interest of, that's what I want to do. So I went out and went to each country, because that's what we do internationally. We go to you know, Spain, Mexico, Argentina. Recently, about four years ago, we entered South Korea, Germany, Italy, and Norway. Um, we sell about four to six projects a year. And the whole point to this, as you saw in Julian the Phantoms, was for me to have a voice in the deciding table factor. So, meaning that I sit with executives and I get to make the choice who who comes into the projects. And that was really important for me because you know, many years doing this in this industry, there was never one of us representing that. So that was my main focus and now we've become one of the leading you know, intellectual property producers that bring all this great IP here to do in English. Um, and just recently, I just found out yesterday that I just sold something one of the projects oh, cool. that, that I had, which is fantastic. <laughs> and our next thing is we're doing a show for Fox, it's gonna be one of their big tent poles uh, from Spain, we brought it here, so very excited about that. So that's pretty much my journey, uh, what, how I got started. <laughs> thank you so much, George, really, thank you. <laughs> Laura. Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming. Not only is it like we have this panel, it's really nice to have people come to the panel, which is really, really important. That shows that people are really interested in seeing you know, and hearing what we have to say, which is really, really important. So thank you also for coming. But I'm from, I'm born and raised from Queens, New York. I'm New York and I'm the third generation of my family to pursue a career in garment making. My, Grandmother came to the States from Puerto Rico when she was a kid to start sewing in the uh, 
um, sweatshops in New York City. And so it's really amazing to kind of be here having a career in costumes. Um, but I started off being a nerd. I was a fan at wonder, you know, like cons like this. I started cosplaying when I was 13, and that started some of my interest in costuming. And then um, I didn't realize you can have a career out of it. And when I realized you could, I went and uh, went to the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. I interned on Broadway, volunteered on a lot of student film sets, was really eager, and then. Um, my husband and I moved out to Los Angeles, where we've been here now for almost a decade, trying to, you know, our careers grow together. And I've been here doing, I was a customer at Disneyland. I was a costume PA on multiple you know, studio films and TV shows, and just kind of working my way up. And now I'm here, I'm a member of the Costume Designers Guild as a full-time costume designer. Um, and uh, part of their diversity committee, because this is you know, just kind of continuing the mission behind the camera in terms of uh, you know, showing the importance of different stories being there as well. So uh, that's kind of my story in the most okay. succinct way. Gracias, Laura. Sandro. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Sandro Morales Santoro, uh, born and raised in uh, Maracay, Venezuela. It's a small uh, city in Venezuela. <laughs> yeah, another Venezuelan. You know. we're, we're a minority within the minority, and it's, it's good to see another Venezuelan here. Um, so yeah, right on. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a music composer. Um, I started studying music when I was six years old, um, playing uh, drums and uh, keyboards and uh, you know piano, guitar. Uh, played in, van, in, in bands in Venezuela, and uh, you know anything from like Afro-Caribbean music to Nirvana. Um, fell in love with the music of uh, John Williams, um, and um, and then also um, Latin American composers like Astro Piazzolla, Waldemar Romero. You know people who were doing theater in South America. Um, but you know when I graduated high school, uh, my family, all of them lawyers. Uh, we're, we're like, oh yeah, music, <laughs> right? Like, go do like a real job first, and then uh, and then like you can do your your little music as a hobby. So uh, I'm a lawyer in Venezuela. If you ever get in trouble over there, <laughs> you can like reach out, and uh, you know I can hook you up. But um, but here in the states, you know, like uh, after I graduated as a lawyer, worked for a little bit, saved money, went to Berklee College of Music in Boston, um, got a scholarship over there, you know graduated and then moved to LA and in, in uh, 2009 and here you know it's been it's been an interesting trip for sure you know like it's you know working uh, at first through other composers got to write music for shows on Netflix Hulu you know network shows and uh, little by little you know making contacts and you know getting my own uh, opportunities and uh, it's been for sure you know we're going to talk about that but you know, it's been a challenge as a as a latino composer cuz there's a, a stigma you know um, of like and especially with music, you know, people assume that because you are from a from a specific place, you know, like you can only do a, a specific kind of music. And yeah, for sure, you know, I know about all that music, but you know, there's so much more. You know, I studied, you know, the classical uh, European, you know, um, music and and jazz and all of that. So you know, it's. Uh, um, yeah, I'm 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 working towards you know opening the door for composers like like myself. So. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. Alisa. Alisa Zaragoza. I am an AD, assistant director. I thought I wanted to direct when I first got here, and then I directed for the first time, and I was petrified and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but I realized I wanted to be on set, and I love ADing. Um, and if you need any, Jorge, if you need any, George, if you need any uh, directors, please let me know. We have a director member Absolutely. list of uh, Latino directors. Ready Amazing. To Absolutely. But uh, thank you all for joining us. This is great because uh, behind the scenes, these wonderful people exist, not just in front of the camera or directing. So we are here. We're here to stay. Thank you. Awesome. Bravo. Gracias. Thank you, Lisa. Francisco. Yeah, I feel like I'm very much standing in the shoulders of everybody in this, on this panel. Because, <laughs> you know, I graduated undergrad two years ago in the middle of the pandemic and had to move back in with my parents 
watch Love Victor under the bed sheets because <laughs> you get it, queerness. Uh, <laughs> and, and very much use that time. You know, I had made short films and we had shown at a lot of film festivals. Um, but, you know, we didn't think the industry existed after that. In that moment, I thought, I'm never going to direct again. The only thing that I could do is write. So, because writing was free and he, I didn't have to wear a mask to do it. <laughs> um, so I wrote, I wrote my, myself out of my own kind of home because um, it was my ticket out because I was like, if I have the best script, then I can move to LA. Um, but I used that time in the middle of the pandemic to reach out to as many like TV writers and like creators as possible through Twitter, through Instagram, everything and be like, can you just give me like 15 minutes of your time <laughs> and like tell me about your journey? Um, so I met a bunch of Latino writers uh, through that process and one of those uh, co-creators, uh, one of those writers was the co-creator of Hentified. Uh, which was a show that I really, really, really loved. And, you know, he had mentored me for a while, but in the middle of the pandemic, I think he knew that I needed a little saving. Uh, so I sent my script to him, and he was like, if you ever move to LA, I'll make sure you have a job. And I was like, you're lying. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna take you up on it. And I moved to LA, and I became his personal assistant. And then I became the writer's assistant on season two of Anthified. Then I became the script coordinator. And then I became a writer on the show, kind of nice. in the craziest six months of my entire life. Um, and they were mentors, and they knew what they were doing by giving me that shot. So when once I got that co-write, everything kind of opened after that. Right? I got my managers. I got into the union. All these things, and you know, I, I got to write on another Latino show that's going to come out. Um, called Gordita Chronicles uh, on HBO Max, and it's about an 11-year-old girl who moves from the DR to, to South Florida with her immigrant parents, which I moved from Venezuela to South Florida with my immigrant parents at 11 years old, and obviously I'm a gordito, so I'm like, if I don't write on this show, then what the hell? Uh, <laughs> um, and from then I got to write now on uh, Blockbuster. There's a sh show about the last Blockbuster video in the world, mm -hmm. um, which has a bisexual Latino 20 year old film nerd. And I was like, again, if I don't write on the show, <laughs> <laughs> who else are you going to hire? Um, so there, it's literally been a year and, and three months since I moved to LA, and it's been the craziest thing to be in this panel with all the people that I like straight up look up to. So I'm happy. Bravo. <laughs> Moises, mi amor. Um, I, there's something about the age of 11 that everybody moves to the United States. Uh, <laughs> I also have that story. It was like Flaquito Chronicles. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Bidi Bidi Bamba WonderCon, thank you for being here. Uh, my story actually began with a Japanese animated series called Candy Candy. And for those who yeah. grew up outside of the United States, it was the most telenovela like animated series in the world. <laughs> and every time Monday morning, I was devastated because somebody would die. <laughs> there was like child abuse. I never made it to the States. And it was like, that's how I started story, telling my stories through drawing. And, um, and of course, it evolved. And skipped medical school. <laughs> After college, I um, made writing my purpose to be a storyteller. Um, and uh, I didn't see a lot of people like me um, at that time. So it's just like, well, I have, I, have an, like, I have Spanish. I look up to Carlos Fuentes. Maybe I could be Carlos Fuentes. And so I actually wrote a novel in Spanish because I thought it was easier than using English. Um, so with a sixth grade education, I taught myself how to write. <laughs> uh, and that actually did open some doors. I got a, a literary award in Mexico, and I went back to Mexico. My parents were very confused. They sacrificed everything for me to go back. Um, and, but you know, it paid off because it allowed me to continue with the dream of storytelling and writing. And so when I got back to LA, broke and kind of homeless, um, I did live in a porch for a few weeks. Um, it's like I had to start all over. My purpose was writing. So I went back and studied screenwriting like nobody's business. Like it was the last thing it was you know, for me to do and worked on my craft. And one pilot opened all doors for me. Got me my first manager, my first job um, on American Crime for John Reilly, Oscar winning um, writer. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I realized that the hustle 
the like trying to like make that sort of dream come true without relying on others is, like depends on you. And this is a testament to all of that. I think everyone has a very similar story because Hollywood is not very friendly to Latinos, by the way. No. Uh, and so we're here to tell you it's possible. Uh, you just have to keep on working on what you what you're good at, what you believe in, and then one day you'll be here too. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> You know, one thing I love that's very a familiar theme amongst everybody is community and family and how much we've turned to people in our own community to lift us up and give us opportunities and help us guide through this incredibly difficult process, especially for people in our community. Um, you know, it's really hard to not see people like you uh, working in the industry. And it's a, a testament to the people here when you can see them up here. It says a lot to people who are struggling to get into the industry right now. But even more so, you want to be seen on screen. And I want to ask all of you when the first time, or if you even felt seen already on screen, if you've actually seen yourself or you're working towards actually getting yourself seen on screen, but when was the first time you felt seen on screen? George, I'll start with you. Um, you know what, I think the first time for me was New York Undercover. I don't mm -hmm. know if everyone remembers that show. <laughs> that was kind of like the first thing for me, kind of, of that diversity was gonna be something big. Obviously that was like in the early 90s, I think, the show. Um, but recently, to be honest, not much. Um, that's what we're trying to do is change that is, because the other thing is too is, has, as everyone was talking here, is opportunity. I think we need to create more opportunity. So that means we need to be more in the sense of, as, as, they, as many panelists here, they're creating. So we need to create more. Um, so we can start advancing a lot of Latinos who are talented out there. I mean, there's. Yeah. I read scripts a lot, and I see a lot of talented writers who are unrepresented, have no agents, managers, and pretty much I talk to all these guys, but they all want the what we call the low-hanging fruit, which means people with credits, people, you know, they, they want everything already done. So we need also a lot of more representation on the other side, which is the management agency side, to start elevating our talent. But are we changing it? Yes, that's why for me, my company, we started a small management company, so we can do that more. We did it with Melissa Barrera, we're doing it with another actor named Benny Emanuel from Mexico City, um, who we're giving now the opportunity to come here and be, be seen in the big light, basically. So, pretty much to your answer, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right, I haven't seen myself yet, but I, I know it's coming. <laughs> Laura. Uh, I think it might be a cliche answer, but my, I learned, I'm a huge, huge fan of classic cinema, and, and I learned a lot about costuming by watching a lot of golden era Hollywood films, and a huge, huge fan of them, so the first time was, seeing West Side Story, you know, my fam, it's a New York and true story, and, uh, you know, my, that was like my family. My family came to the States from Puerto Rico, and like they started their life here, you know, with promise of like being able to establish themselves to get out of, you know, like my family is from uh, this Isabella, which, and they're from like the Campo kind of side. So it's like, it was a big change for them to come, and so, I saw that, I was like, oh, this is really great. And then it's really fun and colorful and all these things. And it, you know, and as a child, you're like, oh, I love the color and I love that celebrating the music. And then you grow up and you're like, oh, wow, this was like really was like a singular instance. And you see that, you know, like, never mind like a Puerto Rican story. Like it's also like at large, it's like, oh, never mind this singular like experience. It's not seeing it as much as often. And so it's very, um, and then it feels very kind of isolating. It's like, oh, you have to really kind of search for something that reflects, which is kind of, it's very sad. But at the same time, it's very um, exciting to be part of uh, a generation of creatives that is creating that content. And so that, you know, for all the people who are coming through and trying to be, find their, their comfort and solace in media that we are trying to help change that wave in um, that there's a lot of, you know, a plethora of uh, stories that they can relate with and to be a part of that is very exciting. So helping create it was cool. Thank you, Laura. So um, I guess I'll speak specifically to composers. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, um, living in Venezuela, dreaming of um, 
writing music for film and TV. Um, I also grew up on anime, you know, Japanese animation and video <laughs> games. Um, I couldn't find a lot of representation, a lot of Latinos, and uh, um, I guess like about 10 years ago, um, um, Gustavo Santolaya, mm -hmm. an Argentinian composer, won back-to-back -back, uh, Best Score Oscars. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not about the Oscar, but it's about like the films, you know, a Babel and Brokeback Mountain. Mm -hmm. They weren't specifically about our culture mm -hmm. uh, or specifically about, you know, uh, Latinx characters. So that made me hopeful mm -hmm. that, that, that we could, um, that someone like me, mm -hmm. you know, an immigrant with an accent and, you know, like coming from Venezuela and not knowing anyone here in LA could like come and, and achieve, uh, you know, something. Um, I'm sad to say that in, in that decade since, I haven't seen a lot of uh, our composers, you know, um, scoring major uh, studio pictures or, you know, uh, TV shows, but, uh, but, uh, but there's some advancement, you know, and uh, with the, we're gonna talk about the Composers Diversity Collective, you know, work we're doing to, to generate more opportunities and more visibility for, you know, composers of color, so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Alicia. Uh, I have to say, I didn't start, I couldn't start watching any movies or TVs until I was 18, so I don't know how I ended up here. But <laughs> I have to say that I did, I, when traveling to Mexico, those were the moments that I could see the novelas and I'd watch all the novelas that my cousins were watching. So I did see some sort of representation, but not really because I'm short and I wasn't the tall, blondie, booby girl yeah. that the representation was in Mexico. And then I come here watching the stuff here also not represented. <laughs> so behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, so I'm glad we're now being represented. Yeah. After 20 years of yeah. being in the industry, yeah. 20 years and more, but we're here. Thank you, Lisa. Ben. I'm gonna have a, a problematic choice. Um, <laughs> When I saw Raul Castillo in Looking, I was like, there's something here. Yes. Where I was like, I feel it. There's something it's that- hot. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We all felt that. Yeah. Too. I was like, I don't know. My chest is telling me something. Is that what feels? I don't think that's what feels feeling seen is. I think that's another word for that. Um, kid friendly, sorry. Um, but I think that was one of those moments. Um, I also think like from behind the camera and I got very lucky because I got to work with him, but Marvin Lemus from Hentified literally looks like me. Oh, yeah. Like, on set, I was called Marvin 18 times. <laughs> um, and he, gen like, even when we go to parties together, they, like, hug me, and they're like, Marvin! And then they realize that it's not <laughs> Marvin, it's Francisco. So that was one of those things where I was like, the showrunner of the show that I got to write on was somebody who I generally felt so deeply seen by, and they saw me, and they saw me before, or they saw something in me before I saw it in myself. So I think that was massive, and it's still massive to me. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, like, Latino male bisexuals on TV, like, they don't really mm -hmm. exist much. Um, so to know that there's a show coming like Blockbuster that has a bisexual Latino yes. immigrant mm -hmm. in it, and, I, and to know that I got to put all my bisexual Latino immigrant stories <laughs> in it, <laughs> and be like, oh, shit. like I kind of, I'm part of the, the fixing, um, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna feel very seen when that show comes out. Beautiful. Um, um, my goes back to a little known film with Laura Flynn Boyle, James, uh, Josh Charles, and Stephen Baldwin called Threesome. Um, <laughs> I had, oh, you know, you know. I had nothing to do with me being Mexican or immigrant, but it had a lot to do with me exploring my sexuality as I was college bound. I was like, yes, on the list. Threesome. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you if I did achieve that goal when the air showers, but um, it, it, it was one of the first times I was like, wait, you can do that in film? Yeah. Like, you can talk about these things? Um, and it was really sort of the gateway to the other drugs, like Pedro Almodovar, European cinema, yes, and, and so then I was like, 
my mind was blown. It's like, you can do all of this. And that, that's when I really fell in love with cinema. Um, but that was, that was my gateway drug. <laughs> it's just here. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing it, guys. Give a round of applause real quick for me. Thank you so much. You know, I'm going to start moving now individually. You know, George, I know you have a lot of experience in working on an international level and bringing TV formats together with Julian the Phantoms being based on a Brazilian television series. How can the industry rethink business models and collaborations to uplift Latinx creatives and give them a platform to get their projects made? You know, I think this is what, what I started with. It's representation, not in the front of the camera, but in the behind the camera. So it's very important, like producers like me, to be going to a studio network or streamer to be able to fight for projects. But I think the most important thing is not just projects, is you're fighting for talent. I mean, I'll give you an example. With Julian the Phantoms, we found, you know, Madison Reyes in Pittsburgh, never done acting. Yeah. We looked over 2,000 girls from New York, LA, Texas, wherever else, every corner. And here comes a, a girl who just entered drama school. And her teacher told her, audition for this show, you never know. She doesn't even know how to tape herself, and she put herself on tape, and she did both roles <laughs> in the tape, and, and that was the start. And I saw that moment that we definitely need to fight more to do that, because they do listen. At the end of the day is when you convince them enough to take the chance with you, they do it. Um, I mean, that's what you're starting to see more and more shows coming up uh, from Latino writers, you know, directors are coming up more. So at the end of the day is, look, I, how I got into this industry and was able to get to where I was at is just bringing the best product that I could. Yeah. That's it. And tell the best story and bring the best team around you that you can. So that's pretty much. Thank you. And you know, talking about the team that's behind the scenes, I want to actually shift gears and go to you, Laura, talking about your experience as a Latinx queer costume designer. And, and tell us why it's so important for to have that representation behind the camera and how it's influenced your art. When you're, I think there's something really poignant, like growing up in a community that you can't see in media, and then you end up being a creator within that media, and you feel that hole missing, and you feel a responsibility to fill that hole. And so, you know, I think as a costume designer, and specifically, I think a lot of people associate fashion and things like that. And I like to think costume design is more like live action character design. I'm a big fan of animation. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, so when you're creating characters, there is a responsibility when you're doing characters to understand also not only the visual, maybe fun fashion aspect, but also the social impact of what you're designing to put on camera. And the conversations you have to t change maybe ideas of representation, to fix lazy stereotypes, mm -hmm. to challenge maybe casting choices and in terms of that. Um, and as a department head, you're allowed to be a part of those conversations. And I think it's really important because you know what it's like to watch something and feel not seen and feel something missing. And that when you're in a position to be able to change that conversation in course, even in a small way, I think is really powerful and it's can be very scary and challenging, um, but I think it's incredibly important. You know, like, we don't have to have, you know, like every single Latino woman with a little cross with hoop earrings, you know, there's like, you know, it's like you can change that look, you know, you know, and I think it's very, you know, or it's the same idea of like, you know, I also think that um, being a creative in that space is like, oh, you know, I think it's also like, oh, you're Latin, you can only tell Latin stories. It's like, well, white people have been telling all sorts of stories for yeah. God knows how long, so why don't you let us do it in our way, in our spaces, and so, and so just because I'm a Latina queer costume designer, I can work on something that isn't that because it is a human story, just how other people have been telling our stories. So I think it's really important that that, you know, that's good too, so. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> Giving voice behind the camera is, is so important, especially for every aspect. And that's why I want to go to you, Sandro. You know, I want to talk about the indie feature, feature you scored called Plastico. You know, tell us a little bit about how you brought your own individual voice and through the music to kind of express what the characters were going through with your own experience. For sure. Um, so Plastico is a, 
deeply personal um, project for me, um, even though you know I didn't have anything to do with the inception of the of the project. But um, it's about it's a it's a political satire about the military culture in uh, Venezuela during the you know starting with the government of uh, Hugo Chavez, um, and. Yeah, it's a complicated subject for, for all Venezuelans. There's a bit of trauma <laughs> for all of us, regardless of which side of the political spectrum you're on. Um, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of division of families and hate and all kinds of things. So uh, when, when I was uh, approached to score this project by a super talented director, uh, Veronica Compalic, who's from Venezuela, but she shot it here and here in LA. Um, yeah, it was, it was intense, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but to answer your question, you know, um, my voice, um, you know, I love working with, with, with uh, singers. I love working with choirs. Um, and I haven't had a, a lot of chance to do it. You know, I've done a lot of work for TV, and, you know, it's, it's a different kind of sensibility, you know, working with choirs, very specific. With this film, uh, we were trying to um, find the way to express the the what you know the, the, the film is about soldiers dealing with an abusive uh, commander mm -hmm. uh, who who you know it's it's trying to indoctrinate them uh, and um, and 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 a lot of you know abuse happens and you know uh, physical and psychological and and I felt you know like a, this is kind of what all Venezuelans have been going through th mm -hmm. through this through this 20 year uh, span of, of of this thing you know this political upheaval. And um, so, you know, the choir, the, the score is only choir. Uh, we recorded in, in Budapest with a 30-piece choir. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was amazing for me because, you know, first the director gave me the, the confidence to just, like, go and, and um, you know, just bring whatever, you know, I felt was going to help, you know, tell the story and, and show what these characters were feeling. And then, you know, the, the choir was a very expressive way to just like, um, you know, you know, express, you know, the, this feeling of pain, uh, you know, that, that, that the characters, were, everything that the characters were, were going through. So, so yeah, it was, it was a very unique, unique experience for me. Oh, yeah. Fantastic, good, thank you. Speaking of, of uh, definitely embattled environments, let's talk about the film set for a minute. <laughs> uh, Alicia, you were on Instructions Not Included, which is such a staple of Latinx filmmaking history with Eugenio Derbez. You know, it shattered box office records, both in the US and in Mexico. You played a pivotal role in that film as the assistant director. Can you tell us about your experience working on that? And for everybody who doesn't know, it's one of the most challenging positions <laughs> on set, and we can't survive without people like Alicia. So please uh, take it away. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting, um, so it was called uh, Hombre de Piedra initially, so it all changes as of course. two years go by, and then the film is finally put out in theaters. Um, th what they did was they shot most of it in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Then they came and shot two weeks here in LA and did all the exteriors, um, which is challenging because they have to ship everything. We have to be in contact with all the production mm -hmm. people in Mexico and make sure everything gets here and make sure we get everything set for the actors that are coming. Um, what I realized is uh, we're such a different, I mean, as an American, born, raised in America, going to school here, things are so different. I was on, so Eugenio Derbez, lovely director, lovely actor, but I shouldn't say but. It should, be, it was, it's more of a, so time is money. So yeah. every single time we're like, we got it, we got to go, we got to go, because if we don't start at eight in the morning, that pushes our time. So the first AD would call me and say, okay, we're in, it's 8 a.m., so I'd stand next to Eugenio, I'm like, Ya estamos, son las ocho. Ya, 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 ya mero ali, ya mero ali. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, I'd come back and they're sipping their morning coffee. <laughs> they're sipping it. Ali, ali, ya listos, listos. Si, sí, ya tenemos 30 minutos que estamos. Si, sí, si, sí, ali, ahorita, ahorita vamos. I'd come back like 
five minutes later and he's still sipping the coffee. <laughs> I'm by Harris pulling. I'm like, oh, we got to be on set. We have to have our cafecito, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Before <laughs> call time. <laughs> exactly. But what it made me realize is that we have to take a breath because we're constantly going, 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 going. So it's like, you know what? Let him have his morning coffee. What is it going to, he's going to be able to adjust his time later and work with the actress since they had been working in Mexico for a month and some before. So everything is constantly moving, 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 mm -hmm. shifting, shifting, shifting. So we have to adjust as well. Mm -hmm. And I think as a minority in this country, we always have to adjust. So yes. why not mm -hmm. with our own people? Mm -hmm. Why not, why get angry? Why get frustrated? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, this is who we are as a culture. So we have to give that time to ourselves because no one understands us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had it been an, a, a white AD, they'd have probably been mad and probably been calling producers and saying, hey, we can't get the director to move. Right. But it's like, no, let him have his cafecito. I'll have my cafecito. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll sit there and wait. <laughs> but it was lovely. It was a great, it, it is, time is money, but we, we adjust and we figure out how to work with our, our own. Thank you. And I want to quickly switch to you, Francisco, and uh, this is definitely not a quick topic, but as much as we can condense it, you know, I want to talk about diversity and representation when in regards to intersectionality. <laughs> so I'd love to bring everybody to talk about, you know, the shows you've worked on, working on, you've mentioned Hentified, you've mentioned Blockbuster, you've mentioned Gordita Chronicles, you know, and, and how intersectionality plays a big role in those stories. Yeah. You know, that's not a big yeah. question oh, at all. Jesus. <laughs> uh, um, I'm going to simplify it a lot. Uh, but, you know, I, I went to school in Tallahassee, Florida, where, you know, it's literally where the Don't Say Gay Bill passed, yeah. right? Um, and there's maybe one bar that's like gay on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's called Rain, if it's still yeah. open. <laughs> yeah. I'm also gay on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> only. Only. Um, <laughs> Um, but basically, in, the, in, in an environment like that, in a predominantly white institution, being bilingual, being one of the two Latinos in your film class, even in Florida, the parts of yourself you can't really bring into the room, or you have to fight to bring, in, to bring into the room and into those institutions. And then you have a show like Hentified, right? Where you're coming in and you can be bilingual, mm -hmm. you can be an immigrant, mm -hmm. you can be, you know, we have black Latino stories in that writer's room with black Latino writers in that writer's room. We have older Latinos, we have children of undo undocumented immigrants, all in a writer's room. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten very lucky mm -hmm. in my you know, few year-ish time where you can bring all those intersections in the room and they bring a, an authenticity mm -hmm. uh, that you couldn't bring maybe in you know, 10 years before. Yeah. So the even three years before, <laughs> even three years yeah. before. No, I mean to to graduate in a time where Dive a Future President is on, right? Pose is on, all your shows are on. You know, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, and Gorita Chronicles again, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, yeah. Venezolanos, Black Latinos, Black Dominicans, um, in that room brought a certain authenticity that most people don't get a chance to have. Absolutely. Um, and I think that elevates the story and I bring, again, brings authenticity um, to them. And, you know, why does this happen? Is because all those three shows, back to back, were created by Latinx people. Yes. And, you know, and they knew not to have only one of us, right? right? They knew that we brought something different, all of us. You know, they knew that I'm bringing the Gen Z, like, <laughs> let me make sure y'all don't get dragged on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right? And everybody was bringing something important, and it's because they were all short run yes. by Latinx creators, and literally we're all had Latina showrunners on all of them. And even for Bloodbuster, that's not a Latino show, quote unquote, was still Latino created, and, and they had us in the room. So, yeah, I've just gotten very lucky. And I, I, I want to be the sign that y'all's hard work is working. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a beautiful transition to De Moises because, you know, we can't wait for people to give us a seat at the table. 
We just can't. And you're a prime example of someone who creates that damn table. So <laughs> I'd love for you to talk to us. <laughs> I hire the creator of Gordita Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and she's incredible. Yeah. She's a force to be reckoned with. Claudia Forti <laughs> So I will take a little bit of credit for your success. <laughs> Well, on top of that, yeah. most, I, I say thank you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, I mean, I, I, I'm going to get to your specific question, but just as a side note, Moises has been somebody who you can email him with any question you have, and he does not turn his back on any single person in our community, where you can say, hey, I have a question. Who is this person? How can I get into this room? He will advise you, and he has been the biggest open heart to the people in our community. And I just I do want to mention that after that. And there is an absolute reason for that. When I was giving my first opportunity to write for American Crime, for John Ridley, Oscar-winning writer, it was a very diverse, almost like, at that time, even though it was, though it was like <laughs> seven years ago, it was like unheard of, that it was so diverse, a lot of intersectionality, and he respected everyone that was at the table. And when you achieve a dream, like what else do you do? Like you achieve your dream, you know, you pass it on. And we, as you notice, everyone is so unique with a, such a specific perspective. And, and it's just like wonderful to think that there's still so much more space for all of us. Yes. You know, it's not a competition. If somebody writes, mm -hmm. you know, that is Latino, Latinx, with all the intersectionality that comes, like you're also rising. Yes. And the, you're making the case that our stories matter. And so, in a way, I do it in a selfish way because I know <laughs> I'm going to be asking Francisco for a damn job in a bit, you know, and I'll be like, hey, Francisco, remember? <laughs> I can write. <laughs> so, what was the question? <laughs> Just in terms of uh, you know what you've learned about the process of, of bringing your own IP to life. Well, IP, as you all know, is really important. Intellectual property is usually where a piece of work, story, like a comic book, you know, it turns into a TV and film. And Hollywood executives don't believe in original ideas per se, <laughs> and so they are looking for like pieces that perhaps an article or another TV show in another country that were already established in order to bet fifty million dollars on that TV show, and I don't blame them. That's a lot of money. And so very early on, I was like, I gotta get my own IP. What is my own IP? What is my own IP? And coming from being a novelist first, it really did open doors, because you had something. It, well, I wasn't a bestseller, you know, but, uh, but it certainly felt that like I needed to hustle for my own IP. That's actually how I got Selena. I had a different IP. I had the, uh, the live rights of the world's youngest psychologist was a 13 Mexican um, girl who like basically is a genius and is a psychologist even though she couldn't practice. But that, holding that IP, doing the legal work myself and like kind of soft pitching it around was when everybody like, wait a minute, you are doing something else you're not supposed to do in as a staff writer level. And so like, let's set you up with this other um, production company that have the rights to Selena. I'm like, okay, Selena Gomez is not my generation. But, uh, <laughs> well, I can do it, I can do it. Um, and so, and then they told me it was Selena Quintanilla, and then I <laughs> my pants. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 no cousin, no cousin. I, I, I took my pants. And I worked really, really hard for that pitch because it was a general meeting and I came in because it's like, she's a Nikon. She was the first time that I realized that I was Mexican and American. Um, and so I basically had the whole pitch and vision for Selena when I came in that room. And I just gave him little morsels and I got the job the next day. Bravo. And all the IP now, and all the two shows that I've sold now, they're also based on IP. I'm doing the Vanessa Guillen story, The Fort the Murdered Soldier. Uh, Same thing. I went to the family, to the lawyer, and be like, I can do it. it it's my family. I have veterans. And it's, it's being transparent and being careful with that kind of uh, intellectual property. And now all that to say is I'm working on a comic book. I'm going to take out a comic book. I'm being mentored by Phil Jimenez, who is a queer Latino, and many of you know his work. And only because I just don't need to depend on $50 million to create a story. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the power of IP. If you're a creator, if you're a storyteller, just write, just create, create. team up. You can do it. You, you, it writing, 
you can do it on your own, yes. you know. Uh, comic book, find an artist. And it's all about getting your stories out. And if it does well, you'll be dealing with people like me to trying to take <laughs> your to make it to a TV show. So keep on creating, keep on working. Bravo. Woo. I wish we could keep going for hours. And unfortunately, that's already our time, of course, amazing enough, because we could keep having our cafecito and talk about all things. <laughs> um, I do just want to mention all the amazing things that people are on this panel are doing that we didn't get to talk about real quick, which is, you know, Sandra working with the Composers Diversity Collective, George with Cheeto Comics, Alicia with the Directors Guild Association, and Laura with the Costume Designers Guild, all working in different aspects, of course, uh, in how to uplift our own communities. And of course, all the mentorship work everybody's doing as well. Um, I am so honored to have been here with these amazing people and I'm so I hope you got a little bit of a taste of the amazing culture and life that kind of is brought to any day when you have Latinx creatives and storytellers around you um, I'm so happy to know all these people and especially to meet some new faces I love you all mi gente I'm so proud again um, muchas gracias to uh, impact 24 for having us and WonderCon please thank you so much for giving us a space to talk about these issues Please be sure to tag us on the social media posts using imp at impact24pr and the hashtag Nuestras Historias. Remember, Latinx stories matter, we matter, and thank you so much for your time. Woo!